morning to those of you who are joining us online as well as others at the Potchefstroom campus of the Northwest University. Today's webinar is hosted by the World Association of Industrial and Technological Research Organizations, WITRO, the University Capacity Development Program, the Department of Higher Education and Training, and the Northwest University. This is the third and last grant writing workshop, which is part of the grant writing series hosted at the Northwest University in the month of November 2021. I am Professor Wilma Vivius, Research Professor and World Trade Organization Chairholder at the Northwest University, and it is my pleasure to be the Program Director of this webinar. Firstly, I call upon Professor Dumi Moyo, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the Northwest University, to do the opening and welcoming. Uh, good morning to you all and welcome to our third grant writing workshop uh, of this year, which we at the Northwest University are proudly hosting at the Pochestrom campus. Uh, this follows two other workshops that we successfully hosted at Mahikeng and Vanderbilt Park campuses earlier this month. The theme for today's workshop is working together to build research capacity in an age of uncertainty, which is quite an important topic, especially at a time when the higher education sector everywhere faces cuts uh, to funding from its traditional sources. I have great honor in opening this workshop and hope that you will all find, uh, find it to be both an engaging and rewarding experience. These workshops are conducted in collaboration with the World Association of Industrial and Technological Research Organizations, WITRO, uh, and funded by the Department of Higher Education and Training and the University Capacity Development Program for staff and postgraduate students. We have appreciated and enjoyed presentations from internationally recognized experts in the various workshops, uh, sorry, in the previous workshops. And today we are much honored to welcome Professor Steve Greenfield from the University of Westminster, the Law School in London. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome all White Row uh, partners from around the world and members of the Northwest University community who are attending this webinar today. As the Northwest University, we are proud to be the White Row Regional Focal, po focal Point uh, for Africa for 2021 and 2022. For us in the academia, third stream income is particularly crucial for driving our research uh, and grants, whether from public institutions or private foundations, are an important source to explore. So this workshop uh, comes quite handy at a time when the future of research and postgraduate funding looks more and more uncertain. So I wish to declare this webinar open and would, would like to end by thanking the team that put the program together and wish everyone a fruitful uh, day and engagement. Thank you very much. It is now my honor to introduce you to our guest speaker, Prof. Steve Greenfield from the University of Westminster's Law School. Prof. Steve has formal qualifications in law, economics, education, and psychology, and is qualified in both commercial mediation and restorative justice. For over 30 years, he has taught at the University of Westminster's Law School, where he specializes in entertainment and sports law, and has developed a module on legal psychology. Prof. Steve has also worked with a number of sports governing bodies on a local, regional, and national level to improve disciplinary processes by applying the idea of restorative justice. His research interests cover numerous areas, from the portrayal of lawyers in film and television to different areas of sport and entertainment, including coaching, contracts, and other disputes. He has written for a wide range of academic journals and other publications. His most recent work explores the method and the advantage of applying a transdisciplinary approach to the field of entertainment law in order to develop a more comprehensive and holistic understanding of the subject, which may also be utilized within teaching. 
Prof. Steve will now address us on the topic of working together to build research capacity in an age of uncertainty. Hi, welcome to this presentation about uh, research and research planning. I'm in a very cold bit of England at the moment and I was very much hoping to be in, in South Africa in the warm but Covid has put a, a stop to that but I hope everyone is, is keeping well. Um, and in this presentation I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my own research but, but more about a, a wider research agenda. Now my, my back, in terms of my background and I think this is quite important to explain and it's only recently that I've understood where I got to where I am because of the things that I've done. So I, I started off with a law degree but had no intention of ever going into, in, into practice. And I then did an MSc in a different subject. It's, it's actually in industrial relations and, and personnel management. And I sort of stumbled into teaching almost by accident and have stayed there ever since. So I've been teaching law and for over over 30 years and as part of that I did a, a postgraduate certificate in higher education so to understand a bit of the theory behind behind teaching and I then moved on and did a graduate diploma in psychology because I was interested in the subject and I've started to, and I've used elements of psychology in the work that I do um, and a PhD as well now that's sort of interesting because when I first started teaching law, nobody, one person in the entire department had a PhD, and that's changed a lot. So it wasn't seen as a route, it's certainly in terms of law teaching here, that you would do a PhD and then go into, into teaching. So I've hopped about and done different subjects, and I think that probably explains why I have the view I do about research. I've also more recently become a certified civil and commercial mediator. So I trained as a mediator. And then more recently, I also trained as a, a practitioner in restorative justice. Because I have an interest in, in, in that field, and I thought it was quite important to understand that the, the, the practical dimension to it. Now, if you look at my publications, and I'm, I'm not saying they're particularly brilliant, I, I've got a lot of various publications across a whole range of different journals and my research profile isn't one that you could it, it hops around a bit so for example I've published in history journals in sociology and more, more recently I've become interested in in publishing in perhaps more populist things so I've done a couple of pieces for the conversation this year so I've got a sort of quite an odd profile. So what, what I thought it'd be worth covering is, is what research and why am I doing it? So we don't ever really stop and think about what we're going to do and why we're doing it. And I think that's actually become really important. And most of us are probably also teachers and we spend a huge amount of time thinking about our teaching and what we're teaching, how we're teaching. And yet the research side of our, of our work just seems to be a bit more sort of ad hoc. And we might do it for a number of reasons. Um, it might be because it's part of your career path. Um, it might be you've got a, a, a real passion for it. And I do believe that the best research is, is born out of a passionate interest. But I think we, we ought to think more about our research, what it is and why. And then we need to plan it. And I've always found that, that I've never really properly planned things in terms of my research. And yet I, I am quite meticulous about my teaching planning. And part of that planning is not just what I'm doing, but what skills and resources do we need? What, what do I actually need? And do I have the right set of skills? Do I need to do some more training? So perhaps I need to do some, some more work around qualitative or quantitative methods and then I thought we could talk a little bit about collaborating and, and particularly with, with people and subjects and this has really become I think part of a new sort of agenda to think about collaboration more um, particularly across across disciplines 
And then I'm going to move on to what I think actually is where the future should be for all of us, which is around transdisciplinary research. And it's something I've got really interested in the last couple of years and started to engage with, both in terms of my research, but also I'm trying to, I'm trying, to, trying to write about it and and also uh, bring it into my, into my teaching. Now, in terms of what research, there's been a shift in certainly in the UK around the type of research that's done, and I'm really talking here about. Um, about the areas that I'm more familiar with. And it's about producing research that has impact, real-world impact. So our research gets measured every six years. And we have to submit our research to be to be looked at and decide. What, and this, is, this is outside of the institution, so the institution makes a submission. Impact is a, is a relatively new phenomena, and we've got a definition there from the from the from the framework, which talks about it's something having an effect or a change of benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy, services, health, the environment, quality of life, and this is the crucial bit beyond academia. So the policy has moved towards creating research that has some impact on our lives, but it's very widely drawn so it's got to move outside of the institution beyond academia and that's where we started to th think more about you know particularly in the social science and humanities how do you produce work that has impact that goes beyond writing you know the definitive piece around you know your your research expertise your discipline expertise but we've now moved on a little bit further from um, uh, impact, and we're now in a in an era of of knowledge exchange, and this is much broader. And we're now being measured on our knowledge exchange activities. Uh, and I've got a definition here about what the aim is, and I've put bits in bold the to increase the efficiency and effectiveness in the use of public funding. Now, clearly, this is, you know, who pays the piper calls the tune. So if you're if you're being funded with public funds, then the research has to have some tangible benefit. So further a culture of continuous improvement in universities. So we need to think more about what we're doing and why we're doing it. It will allow universities to better understand and improve their own performance. And here's the other crucial bit as well as to provide businesses and other users with more information to help them access the world-class knowledge and expertise embedded in higher education providers. So the idea is that we have all this knowledge and we're producing this knowledge all the time and somehow that knowledge needs to go out into the wider world. So if you like, this is perhaps what you might call impact plus or actually research is just an element of knowledge exchange. So the agenda is very much about us moving our knowledge that we create out into the wider world. And I think it's, it's quite, that happens more naturally with science, with the natural sciences. So it's for us, it's a question of how do we develop our, our research and move it out into the, into the wider world. So the... The background to the knowledge exchange framework is that we have research that creates new and useful knowledge and but we also work with lots of other people to ensure the knowledge is used so we're now really talking about knowledge becoming beneficial measurable so knowledge exchange so if you like those are the parameters to, to what are you going to research and those are the pressures to research something that has impact or can be used in, in a broader sense. So if we're planning our research, we need to think about skills and resources. But our first point is, is what research is relevant. So what am I going to do and investigate that's relevant, that has that dimension of impact or knowledge exchange? 
it's no good if I just beaver away producing something that doesn't doesn't go anywhere. Uh, in terms of the current, you know, the current climate, I suppose you could argue that we've, um, you know, we're commodifying knowledge in some in, in in a sense, commodifying research. But I guess that's that's the world that we we've got around us. So, how do I identify problems and issues? And I'm going to give an example in a bit of, of some, some of the things that I've done or, or, or one case study. So we're really talking about real world problems and how does our research then, how is it designed to address those, those problems and issues? And as part of that, we need to think about the boundaries. So we identify an issue or an area we want to explore and identify the problems and the issues. What are the boundaries to it? Are they contained with our, within our own discipline? Are they con contained within the academic field? Or do we need to look beyond that? So where is the knowledge and the information? Who has it? Often it's, it's vested in people. So people's experiences and people's lives. Now that may lead us on to needing a new set of skills around interviewing and understanding people's lives. So not necessarily interviewing in terms of um, designing some qualitative uh, work, but perhaps understanding about people's experiences and lives in, in, a, in, a, in a more informal way at the outset. So we start to build our parameters to our, to our project. And then the question is, what resources do I, do I need? Do I need some a research assistant? Do I need to be bought out of some of my teaching time? Do I need some software? Do I need travel expenses? So what do I actually need and what's available? Now that goes back often to what's the research and what's it about and what are the problems and what are the issues? And one of the things that this sort of broader approach to, to research has done is open up different streams of funding. So it might be that actually you can find funding from the commercial sector for some issues and problems. So as, as the research, the idea or the, of research has broadened, perhaps we can look elsewhere for funds rather than the, the more traditional traditional routes. But it all depends really on what it is you're doing. Collaborating. I think this is really important about uh, collaborating and I think this has become even more important in the in the COVID environment where things have become quite lonely and quite internalised. You know, a lot of us have been teaching online and we've missed the interaction with, with students and with colleagues. And it's been qu quite difficult in some ways. I mean, I, I would say that I'm a natural a collaborator and I've worked with a, with a wide range of people. I do stuff on my own, but I do like collaborating. And I think there are, are lots of advantages in terms of uh, keeping yourself going through difficult times and, and feeling that you're part of a team. And I'm not great with deadlines and having someone else who I'm responsible to, or I feel responsible to, helps with things like deadlines. Um, so who do I want to collaborate with? Could be colleagues from the same department or institution. So you might naturally work with people you, because you know more about the people around you. So you might naturally gravitate towards people who you, uh, you feel comfortable with. But what about colleagues from other institutions? I mean, increasingly we're looking at, 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 at work that covers more than just one, one, one country. So what about international? So either institutions within one country or international institutions, which is why I think you know, building links with international institutions is, is really important uh, because you can get develop different perspectives around things and just get different viewpoints. And it's, it's really interesting to do work that, that covers more than one, more than one country. But you might also want, and this is where people start to get a bit, a bit nervous with colleagues from other disciplines. So putting together teams, or it can even just be two of you working from different, looking at something from a different angle. 
from a different discipline. So you might still be just confining it to academic work, but looking at it in a, in a slightly different way. But also other interested bodies. There's a, there's a whole range of NGOs, charities, commercial organisations, and you might want to work in partnership with, with those to deal with the problem that you've identified. So I think I would say just don't limit yourself and think about who can contribute. And that's very much what a transdisciplinary approach is. It's, it's, it's about casting the net quite wide. And the last point is about working perhaps with consumers and others. And as an example here that I, that I found from 2018, which is around um, mental health nursing. So there's, there's academic analysis of, of, of mental health nursing to try and improve you know, mental health nursing. What do we know about it and how does it work? And... This is, this is an interesting idea that, 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 that the authors of the piece suggest that significant benefits result from consumers becoming an in, integral part of research teams. So people who are in receipt of mental health nursing can become an integral part of the research team. And this highlights the substantive potential of consumers to become recognised stakeholders in mental health research. So rather than looking at it just through, through one end of the telescope, you want to know what the consumers think. And one way of doing that is to involve them in the research team. So rather than just asking them about their experiences, they become an integrated part of, of the project itself. Now, the rationale for this, um, that someone one of the per people that they interviewed about this, um, and I think this is a really important quote. Um, for me, it's kind of about the thing of being made aware of issues and the significance of issues that I wouldn't otherwise be aware of or not as keenly and that you don't get from your own reading and writing. Now, this sort of takes me back to the, where we started from about identifying issues and problems and that's perhaps how we find them is by talking to people outside of um, academia to find out what are the real world problems. So there's a whole area of understanding you're not exposed to until you talk to the service users. And I think this is true in many areas about understanding what's happening in the real world, which leads us into the idea of the real world, real world problems. Okay, but and this, if some people are, are are quite nervous about moving beyond their discipline, I think that's why I started off with my background, in that I've never felt that I really just belonged in law, and I've hopped around, and and maybe that's not always a good thing, but I've picked up bits from other disciplines. Now, I would never suggest that I. I would say I have a certain level of expertise in 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 theory and practice of of teaching. But, you know, my psychology knowledge is, 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 is limited, uh, as is my, the, the work that I did on my MSc. And my PhD is basically around bits of film studies. So I wouldn't claim to be an expert in those fields, but I recognise uh, when they're useful. Um, and very much the idea of going beyond a discipline has, has become quite, quite popular. Now, if it's become quite popular, it, 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 that helps in terms of things like funding. So this is from something that I've de de developed quite recently um, about moving towards a transdisciplinary research. But this is not for everything. OK, this is this is not all projects. Um, so I've suggested here the terminology of a more expansive approach, i.e. going beyond your discipline, has several versions. And I think these do get mixed up. You know, we talk about being multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, -discipl and then finally uh, transdisciplinary. Um, and I think it's the last one that actually is, is more in keeping with perhaps the new research agenda. Uh, the variations are not always apparent as to what they mean, what they are, and people interpret them in, 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 in very different different ways. 
Um, and I think uh, Klein makes a really good point here that staying in your discipline is safe. You know the boundaries to it. And within your discipline, there's lots of unknowns anyway because you, you don't know everything about your own discipline. So I know very little about, for example, aspects of international law or property law because I've never really spent much time on them. Um, and as, as Klein says, standard models of discipline, they accentuate stability and natural order, boundary formation and maintenance. And, and I think you, you can feel comfortable in them because you know the parameters. And it is uncomfortable setting outside them. Um, I'll leave this one. It's just a, a new form of learning. It talks about uh, involving different parts of society. Uh, it starts with real world problems. And I'm going to push on past this to the example. Uh, I think it perhaps works best with an example. Um, and I've always had a long interest in sport and playing sport and studying sport. And a lot of my research work is, 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 around, is around sport and sports governance. So even though I might have some traditional legal research, it's probably got a socio-legal tinge to it. Um, and one of the things I, I started to get very interested in was around disciplinary processes and, and how the law was kept out of, of, of sports governance. And I got interested, but partly because I still play a bit of cricket very badly uh, at a very low level in my local cricket league and seeing player behaviour. So it was from a, it was it was from, if you like, participant observation about how people were behaving, and perhaps the changes in behaviour. Uh, the league that I play in is a big league in a geographical area. It's the biggest league in the area. Um, has over a hundred teams. So I got interested in in the in the disciplinary issues around player behaviour and particularly the abuse of umpires and other players and sadly you can see it and 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 that leads on to the environment that we're then playing in and 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 how players are deterred from playing because of of the the, the environment is not particularly welcoming and um, and there's a huge number of different factors and and different issues that are going on but cricket is struggling in terms of participation so one of the things that I was interested in is how do we make cricket more appealing and um, more welcoming. So this involved me talking to players. Uh, I, and I, I am a, a club official, so I'm the safeguarding officer and have been for about 15, 15 years at my own club. So I have responsibility for safeguarding and welfare. So in a sense, I already had a, a, a practical dimension to this and, and so I wanted to add, add on to that um, so I started talking to players and the league officials so I talked to the league chairman and the league secretary and uh, the head of the disciplinary committee and we, we, we kicked this around and it's it became apparent this is something they were very concerned about um, because every year they were finding themselves having to set up disciplinary hearings you, all quite these are quasi legal processes with rules of evidence using up a lot of time and and then at the end of the process and it's quite a it's quite a sophisticated process they would inevitably ban players and there's a tariff it's it's almost like the criminal justice system there is a tariff so the level of abuse uh, so many matches uh, higher level of abuse more matches and so what we were doing really was was banning players. You could find them, but not much because they are amateur players. So this is not a livelihood issue. So basically we're stopping the players playing uh, in, in an era where clubs are struggling to find players. And it didn't change player behaviour because effectively the player was thinking that he was in the right. Uh, and that the abuse was merited because of a bad decision or that something had happened or was provoked. So there was no change of behaviour. Uh, players did have to write uh, a letter to an umpire if they'd abused an umpire. But this was forced. This wasn't... Uh, so this was part of the sanction. This wasn't a player having a moment of, of repentance and writing a letter in advance. This was a player being told to write a letter, which for me is utterly worthless. 
So we started discussing the problems with the with the head of the disciplinary committee, and I said, well, I think look, restorative justice could work here. So I said, this is, and I explained restorative justice, and I gave him a presentation as to why I thought it, it would function and how we could actually try to use it to change behaviour, because my whole uh, way of looking at this problem was that that, that actually just banning players was, was really the wrong approach, and what we needed to do was to encourage players to change their behaviour by realising the consequences of of their behaviour in the first place. So we took that through and I said, we, I think we can, we can work some things through with this. So I had a couple of difficult cases to, to, to work with and then the pandemic set in. So this has largely been put on, on hold. So we'd made some really good progress and I met with umpires and they talked about the abuse that they, they face. And they said, well, I, a lot of people give up umpiring because, and if you don't have umpires, uh, you start to have real problems because the game becomes, there's no independent uh, arbiter of decisions, and that causes more problems. So I started putting together a survey for, for umpires, which is where I've got to. But, so this is a sort of piece of research that's halfway through, and I've also applied it to, to rugby, and, and done that at a slightly different level. I've done that at a national level, talking, and they have the similar problem. And they're very concerned about abuse, abuse of referees and referees giving up because of, of player abuse. So the idea is that we can, we can bring something that is established in the criminal justice system. And it's used across a wide range of organisations, in, for example, schools, in order to try to solve a problem. Um, and I actually think there's a huge amount of mileage in here. Uh, so I've started gathering data around abuse and, and applying the principles of restorative justice. Now I think this has huge long-term potential. It has impact and it's using the knowledge created to make fundamental changes. So even though this is quite a small project and, and doesn't require any funding, this is just part of the work that I'm doing, this has considerable impact. I didn't set it, I didn't design it to to have impact, but I think that's just the way I was I, I, I was thinking. So the other thing I've started to do, which is which is a, another whole another uh, presentation or idea, is about involving students. And one of the things that we do have is this huge untapped resource of very bright people, our students. So I've talked there about getting students to, to, to work on projects. And they could be projects that I'm interested in or it could be their own projects. And about encouraging them to develop a, a transdisciplinary approach. So thinking beyond their, uh, beyond their own disciplines. Now this, I think, is really, really crucial. Because our graduates need to be able to problem solve and they need to be able to recognise issues beyond their own discipline and knowing to go and look for knowledge elsewhere. It's no good just to be stuck within your own discipline to, to solve problems. We need our students to have, be critical and creative. And transdisciplinary work, by its very nature, promotes, um, uh, pr pr promotes that critical and creative thinking. So it's a very sort of quick, uh, a quick run through. Um, so uh, the conclusion I would, I would bring to you is that there are new research agendas emerging and we have to get to grips with them and they're, they're a reality okay so that means we can't pretend they're not there so that means that we need to design our research to address real world problems now some people are uncomfortable with that um i think colleagues who, who, who study philosophy or you know, researching areas of philosophy are, 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 are maybe less comfortable. But it, it's it's amazing actually how you can how you can develop projects that involve uh, those sort of areas. So we're talking about real world problems, even they, on a small level like mine in in a cricket league. But that can be upscaled to to sport more generally. And I think what it means is we need a holistic approach. We need to look at problems and identify a whole range of areas in that problem that we need to explore 
and we need to involve different parties and different disciplines. So, although my research project on cricket is is I'm 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 doing it on my own effectively, um, it's got elements of psychology, it's got elements of sport in it that you need to understand, elements about the history of cricket that you need to understand, uh, and, and it's got cultural very strong cultural factors. So. What I'm sort of making a plea for here is, is, to, is to do what we want our students to do, which is think creatively and think imaginatively and construct your research along those grounds. OK, there's a, there's a slide there of references, and I'd be absolutely delighted to discuss with anyone around any of these topics, um, and I will post my email address. OK, thank you very much for listening. I now hand over to Mr. Tinus Foster from the Northwest University Research Support Department to facilitate the questions to Prof. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Tinus. Good day, uh, Prof. Steve. Uh, is there any questions around here? Okay, I don't know if there's any in the chat box, but uh, from here there's nothing. Thank you. It is now my honor to hand over to Dr. Ndumishu Kingu from the White Row Alumni Network for the closing remarks. Um, good morning, um, colleagues, and good morning to the attendees of the Alumni Network, um, or rather of the Northwest University Workshop. Um, it is my honor and pleasure to be giving closing remarks on the uh, workshop that we have just received uh, today. I had wanted to share a short presentation on uh, YTRO, um, but I will speak to it uh, more than anything. Um, as you all know, uh, YTRO is a co-organizer for this uh, workshop. And um, some of you may not know that YTRO is an organization that brings RTOs together, which seek uh, global collaboration and innovation. Um, it is a unique uh, strategic network that fosters uh, international partnerships for sustainable development with consultative state status. It provides access to a global network of diverse sources of knowledge through an open innovation platform. WITRO has membership um, in over 76 countries across the world with more than 160 research and technology organizations. I belong to um, the WITRO alumni network, having been a past member of WITRO in, as a regional representative for Africa. I am part of the network and the network works to uh, act as ambassadors of knowledge of for the association as a repository of White Rose uh, heritage. The network captures the spirit of the global innovation family and allows other former officials also to keep in touch and offer their services to the organization. <clears throat> the um, workshop that we've had today, and particularly the presentation by Professor Steve Greenfield, has uh, been a very interesting insight into the world of uh, research, how to uh, go into research, what research you would like to enter, why you're doing the research, um, planning and the skills that and resources required for all of this. A very important element that he touched on, which resonates very well with the WITRO um, alumni network and WITRO global innovation family as a whole, was on collaborating with people, uh, with subjects, with uh, networks, etc. As I indicated earlier on, uh, White is an organization that encourages collaboration. In fact, it is a network that is set up primarily for research and technology organizations to uh, partner and network with one another. Uh, 
And one of the key elements of network or instruments of networking that Whitro uses is the Syra platform. Syra platform is an online innovation and collaboration hub that can be accessed by uh, members of Whitro from anywhere around the world where they can share ideas, they can call for um, solutions to problems that they may be having or that they may be experiencing. They can call for partners in uh, areas of research that um, uh, are of interest to them and other members of the network may have an interest in. And so um, Whitro provides that platform for collaborating uh, across the world with partners um, in different parts of uh, the continents of uh, the world. And lastly, uh, Professor uh, Steve Greenfield spoke about uh, transdisciplinary research. And transdisciplinary research is yet another area that falls quite well and squarely within the area of ambit of vitro. And this uh, is particularly important because WITRO is a multidisciplinary network of research and technology uh, organizations. And so with these words, I would like to encourage um, the attendees of the workshop to um, consider the um, WITRO network being, becoming a part of it and joining in um, the networking and the global innovation family that WITRO is. In closing, I would like to recognize the fact that this workshop today is the third in a series of three workshops. The first was held on November 12th at the Nahiken campus, Nahiken campus, led by Professor Innocent Napi um, on research collaborations and grant writing for SDG related research in the, um, in the SADC region. Um, I should say here, um, a personal note, that I am an alumnus of the Northwest, Northwest University Mahigan campus, having studied my undergraduate um, Bachelor of Science and honors degrees uh, there. Um, the second workshop was um, on 26th November um, at the Northwest University Pandabil Park uh, campus. It was on formulating research grant proposals for international funding. And it was led by uh, Dr. Shamin uh, Williamson uh, of South Africa. And finally, today we have got um, Professor uh, Steve Greenfield's um, uh, presentation and workshop. And we appreciate the time and the effort uh, that Professor, and the wisdom that Professor uh, Greenfield has shared uh, with us today. Um, with those words, on behalf of the White Road Alumni Network, as well as the White Road Global Innovation Family, I would like to say uh, thank you and thank you for all the attendees for making the time for uh, attending this workshop. I thank you. You can you can answer the questions in the chat box if you want to, Prof. Please. I can't see the questions. Okay, we've got the question here. How, how do one attend to emerging research with a holistic, uh, holistic uh, approach, especially when the researchers are from multidisciplinary fields? Uh, I, I think it's the, the, the bigger the project, the more complex it becomes and, and, and the harder it is to, to manage teams. And I think if you're starting out, you know, you, you, you start out often the best way of doing it is, is to have a small pilot study of something, which you can do with a smaller team. And a small pilot study where you get some results in is also a really good route into, into getting funding because you can then go to funders with your initial results. So if you're trying to create a, 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 a big team, I would start off small, try a little pilot study, but you need to sit down and this is what we would tell our students to do, sit down and brainstorm the parameters to the, to the project. 
and what's in and what's out. Because if we're dealing with, with real world problems, then it's got a huge number of unknowns and parameters and you can't cover everything until you get into these, into these multi-million pound um, projects. So, so it's finding that little niche and what are you going to cover? And often a, a little bit of initial research, which doesn't need much funding, can then open you up to, to working out the parameters more and then going and looking for funding. So I would say start, start small and start with a, a, a small team that you kick the ideas around and you work out your, your, your starting position, gather your data, whether it's uh, quantitative or qualitative data, get your results and then look for funding to develop the project in, in a wider way. I hope that helps. Does whoever asked the question want to come back? Something Makes like sense that? to start small. Um, another question here. How about the methodology across multidisciplinary fields? How can it be merged to come out with a beautiful research science? I think that's really, really interesting in that different, different disciplines have traditionally used different methodologies. So I, I think it's almost... The, the wrong way of looking at it in some ways in that you 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 end up being wedded to your methodology and in fact what you need to do is to look at the problem that you're trying to solve and work out which methodology will deliver the results that you need rather than trying to fit your known methodology into into the project and i think that's one of the problems with disciplines is that you become so wedded to your own approach and it's comfortable, and it's and, and if you're not used to doing um, qualitative work, it's 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 difficult territory. But you bring in people who who have understanding. Now, the other thing of this is that you then develop as an individual, as a researcher, you develop a new set of skills. You could bring your skills to the table and, and merge them with someone else. Now, I'm not suggesting that you create some hybrid, but you work out which is the methodology that that best delivers what you need and then who do you need to deliver the methodology so it's not a question of of shoehorning together bits it's taking a step back which is why these things need to be transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary you need to have different views coming to say okay what methodology have we got do we know that can deliver the answers that we need so it's 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 working backwards and that's quite hard i think because we're so used to being working in, in quite strict tram lines. I hope that helps. Thank you, Prof. Steve, for that one. Uh, we've got the last question we will take. Um, the question is, how can you collaborate with postdoc fellows in our university, Northwest University, in the fields of demography and population studies? Um, can you merge your fields with theirs together? Uh, okay. Maybe you can uh, answer that as well. Thanks. I mean, that, that, those are huge fields, aren't they? And there's a lot within those fields. So I, I think, again, it's, it's, it's turning it around slightly, okay? So, and, and maybe the fact that we keep naming everything as being, a, as being within this field or this field is, is part of our problem. In that, what, what do you want to explore? Is it... Is it around? Is it around some issues around migration or or, or or whatever the issue that you're really interested in? And then and then it's working backwards from it to say, okay, what what are we what are we looking at here? So rather than starting off with the with the field that I'm in, it's what's the issues and problems that I'd really like to address and look at? And then you work backwards and say, okay, so there's a stream here from 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 this field but we need to know a little bit about this field. So who knows a little bit about this? And you then broaden out your, your, your team. So it's, it's looking from the problem end downwards. So what am I trying to resolve here? What's the issue that I'm trying to get to grips with? It's not just necessarily me adding my field to, uh, to, to someone in a different place in the same field. That may be useful. It's it's working. It's making it holistic, okay. And it's trying to break down those those disciplinary boundaries, um, because I think the danger is that we 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 
ignore material outside of our disciplines. And I think that's, that's, that, that's problematic for problem solving. But if anyone would like to email me, I'm absolutely fine. I put my email up in the in the chat. If anyone wants wants to drop me an email and have a discussion, we can have a we can have a one to one. That's that's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you, Prof, and have a nice day. Yes, cold, but <laughs> yeah, and it's a bit yeah. earlier here, so I need another coffee. And it's been 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 lovely to be able to participate. And, and can I just thank all the people who've sorted out the uh, Zama particularly has been fantastic, and the people who sorted out the technology, it's been it's been absolutely brilliant. So well done. We are almost at the end of our interesting webinar, and Prof. Collins Ateba, the Northwest University White Trail representative for Africa, will be con conducting the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to. Professor Vivas, sorry if I don't pronounce your name very well. Professor Vivas, the program director, I would want to thank you. Um, generally, we want to appreciate everybody who took part into this, uh, in this webinar. I mean, research is what we want to talk about. Um, we know the challenges that we face as mankind. We can only address some of those challenges if we engage in research and we talk about research like what we've done today. So I want to thank you for, for directing the program. I would also want to appreciate um, the executive dean for the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Moyo, uh, who gave a welcome address. I think Prof, we want to thank you for that and for welcoming everybody and for making us to feel uh, the listeners to feel at home and to be willing to listen to such a very important topic that we were discussing here today. Uh, colleagues, most uh, important, colleagues, I most want to mention that we I would like to acknowledge the Northwest University, uh, that is the host, and the uh, WATRO, that is a co organizer. Um, like Dr. Dumiso said, uh, WATRO is a very, very important. Um, organization that is that is existing that ensures collaboration across and within disciplines different disciplines specifically just to make sure that um, life becomes better for mankind and therefore we want to acknowledge the office of the dvc r and i uh, northwest university we also want to colleagues thank uh, members of the research support office uh, all of them through the direction, the directives of uh, Professor Nenesi Habi. I think it's it's just been wonderful. Um, very great initiatives, as you heard from Dr. Zmango. This is the third uh, webinar that we are having, um, and 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 it's really been rich. It's really given us opportunities to expand on what we do and to think beyond. Uh, colleagues, let me also mentioned Professor Greenfield all the way from London. Prof, we want to really, really thank you for taking up your time to put such a wonderful presentation, something that is stimulating to talk about some hard issues that colleagues in the field, some would not want to hear, uh, where you mentioned issues of relevance of the work that we do, and also the need to do research that has an impact on the community. Uh, sometimes it becomes a very difficult topic to discuss it within colleagues, but I think it is very, very important that from time to time we have this type of platforms where we can discuss this very, very difficult topic so that it stimulates our ideas and it directs what we do. Colleagues, I also want to thank Dr. Simango Dumiso, uh, who is a watcher, uh, he says WATCHO alumni, but I see him as a WATCHO uh, member. I think they have done very, Dumiso, you've done quite a lot for WATCHO and for, for, for the African continent. Uh, and the well at large, we, we really want to thank you very much. I also want to appreciate colleagues who are all over, from the, all over the world who were part, participating in this webinar, especially those who are at uh, WATCHO focal points. We want to thank you. We want to say, 
it was very enriching for all of us and we hope we'll have these opportunities from time to time to share ideas and therefore help us to progress as colleagues and as humans. We also want to thank all WATRO alumni who were either present or could not make it, but we want to say together, we're going to make uh, this association very, very great. So colleagues, thank you for your time. I hope you learned something. I hope we have questions in our minds or some stimulating ideas that we want to go and look at and see mm -hmm. how we address some of the issues that have been raised or either incorporate them in the work that we do. So from my side, it was just to say thank you and uh, to all those who presented and those who participated, either in ensuring that this becomes a, a, or the, 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 the webinar took place and we want to thank you and we want to indicate that really it was a success. Thank you very much. Bye. It has been a pleasure being with all of you today. I thank you and I wish you all of the best.